Cambodia files. Good morning and welcome to the COVID-19 version of the Kittery annual 4th of July celebration. Uh, actually, this is only the second annual celebration. We just started this last year. Uh, as I hope you know, Kittery is actually the oldest town in the entire state of Maine. We were incorporated in 1647, meaning that uh, this town is actually more than 125 years older than the United States of America itself, um, which means we have a lot of history here. And for instance, Kittery is also the only home, the only town to produce one of the 56 signers, the Declaration of Independence. General William Whipple, seaman, soldier, statesman, and signer, was born right here in Kittery in 1730. Uh, the house that he grew up in still stands right outside the back gate of Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. One of the things that's always uh, fascinated me about General Whipple is he served in the Continental Congress with some of the, the intellectual giants of that time, or, or of any time. I mean, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams. Um, but William Whipple, he was a man of letters, but he was also a man of action. And while his contemporaries were going to Harvard and universities like that, uh, William Whipple, as a young man, uh, shipped out to sea as a cabin boy. And I want you to think about uh, what, what a rugged way of life that was back in the mid-1700s, life at sea in those wooden sailing ships. Uh, it was not for the faint of heart. But uh, William Whipple was a ship's master by the time he was 21 years old. And by the time he was 30, he'd earned enough, uh, he'd made his fortune as a sea captain and was able to retire to um, uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, across the river. Uh, he eventually married his first cousin, uh, Catherine Moffat, and together they lived in Moffat Lad House, uh, which still stands today. is actually one of the uh, most popular historic attractions in the city. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you should definitely check it out. Captain Whipple, as he was known then from his seafaring days, uh, became one of the early leaders of the American Revolution here in the seacoast. Um, he was uh, on the Committee of Safety. He was a colonel in the local militia. And in 1776, he was uh, selected as a delegate to the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia. And it was there, of course, that he signed the Declaration of Independence in July of 1776. Another fascinating thing about Whipple is he put his pen to that document and, and in doing so basically became an outlaw uh, in the eyes of those who were still loyal to King George. But he then put down his pen and he took up his sword because he realized that the power of the pen sometimes has to be backed by the strength of steel. And, uh, and that sword actually is on display today at that Moffat Lad House over in Portsmouth. And uh, it was given to him by his father, who was also a sea captain. And there's a, uh, an inscription in French that says, men make war, God grants the victory. General Whipple uh, took part in, even as he was serving in the Continental Congress still, took part in uh, military campaigns in Rhode Island and Vermont and New York. Uh, he was at the Battle of Saratoga, one of the pivotal moments of the Revolutionary War because it, it established, uh, showed the world that this ragtag army could go toe to toe with the brightest, you know, the, the, the mightiest military force in the world. Uh, General Whipple actually helped negotiate the terms of the British surrender and he was then given the honor of escorting gentleman Johnny Burgoyne back to Boston so he could put him on a boat and ship him back to England. 
there's a uh, there's a popular legend uh, regarding William Whipple and his slave uh, Prince. Uh, the story goes that they were getting ready for one of their military campaigns and General Whipple said, Prince, hurry up, we got to get going so we can fight for our freedom. And Prince looked at his master and he said, I don't have any freedom to fight for. And according to the story, General Whipple looked Prince in the eye and he said, you know what, you're absolutely right. So as of now, you're a free man. Now let's get ready and go fight for our freedom together. Now, I don't know how much of that is folklore and how much of it is reality, but the, the truth is Whipple did recognize the hypocrisy of fighting for his own freedom, even as he held another man in bondage. And he, he, and he did ultimately free uh, Prince. Um, the general fell into uh, ill health toward, uh, a, a, after the Revolutionary War. He wound up having to resign his military commission, had to leave Congress in 1779, but he still continued to, to serve the public. He was a uh, circuit rider on the New Hampshire Superior Court, uh, making his rounds on horseback. And, and he was still on horseback, ever the man of action, uh, when he suffered a heart attack and fell from his horse, and he died a few days later in uh, November of 1785. However, General Whipple has now returned to Kittery, to the uh, home of his birth, to give a reading of the Declaration of Independence that he signed so heroically, so boldly, in 1776. So it is my honor to, to introduce General William Whipple of Kittery. I'd like to thank Mr. D. Allen Kerr and the town of Kittery for inviting me here to deliver the Dunlop broadside. It is always a pleasure to visit my hometown. I was thinking on the way over here about how much pollen was in the air and uh, realized I was having a very difficult time keeping my horse clean. I think I shall speak to Benjamin Franklin. Maybe we can come up with an automatic horse wash that you can just walk through. Uh, while riding on the ferry across the river, uh, there was a sojourner standing next to me and he was wrestling with a sack that contained something inside which was very much alive and wanted out. I spoke to the gentleman with the sack and said if I were a gambling man I would assess that you have uh, or you are transporting a very live creature in that sack and the man said indeed and I too am a gambling man and if you sir can guess how many chickens I have in this sack I shall give you both of them. I will take these chickens to the Whipple house where my wife will turn them into a chicken pot pie this afternoon. Really looking forward to that. In the words of Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence of which I am about to read, the marvel of all history is the patience with which men and women submit to burdens unnecessarily laid upon them by their governments. I, William Whipple, stand with my countrymen, a signer of the Declaration, knowing the risks and sacrifices involved in part to you, and hopes that you are encouraged by my mindset. I hope that you will join us in this glorious cause. Pray that our struggle is brief and that we never forget the price that has already been paid on our behalf that we teach and remind our children that freedom comes with a cost, that with freedom comes responsibilities, and that our independence is truly worthy of living and dying for. Now I'm going to read to you the Declaration of Independence, composed by Thomas Jefferson. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the pol political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth 
the, the separate and equal stations to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. Huzzah! Huzzah! We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Huzzah! Huzzah! That to secure these rights, governments are institu instituted among men, deriving their just power from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such forms as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate this government's long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariable the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient suffering of this colonies and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment and absolute tyranny of these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws that most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance Bye. Uh, Bye. unless suspended in their, their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he is utterly neglected to attend to them. Bye. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodations of large districts of people unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the in legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to the tyrants only. Aye. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. Aye. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasion on the rights of people. He has refused for a long time after such desolation to cause others to be elected whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to their people at large for their exercise the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. Bye. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose, obstructing the laws of naturalization of foreigners refusing to pass others to encourage their migration hither and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establish, establishing judicial powers. He has made judges depending on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substances. Fine! Fine! He has kept among us in times of peace 
standing armies without the consent of the legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to civil power. He has combined with others to subject, subject us to the jurisdictions foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledgeable by our laws, giving his assent to their act of pretended legislature. For quartering large bodies of armed troops amongst us. Aye. 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 For protecting them by mock trials from punishment for any murders which they should commit on, on the inhabitants of these states. For cutting off our trade with all parts of the world. Aye. Aye. For imposing taxes on us without our consent. Aye. For depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury. Bye. Bye. For transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses. For, ab Bye. for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province. Bye. Establishing there an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. For taking away our characters, abolishing, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our government. Five! For suspending our own legislature and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. Bye. Bye. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burned our towns and destroyed the lives of our people. Bye. Bye. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation and tyranny already begun with the circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. Bye. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. Bye. He has executed domestic insurrection amongst us and has endeavored to bring in the inhabitants of our frontier, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguishable destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Aye. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the humblest terms. Our repeated peti petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus, thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Aye. Nor have we been wanting in attention to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislator, legislature to extend an unwarranted jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these insurpations which would inevitably interrupt our connection and respondences. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of co consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity with denounce which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war and peace friends. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in General Congress assembled, appeal to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of her intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that this United colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states. They are, they are absolved 
from all allegiance to the British Crown and that all political connections between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance in the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. Thank you one and all for listening to this most glorious rant. May God bless all of you in our country's most difficult time. Shoulder your firelocks. Rhyme and load. Make ready, present, fire! What are your fire locks?